First, I'd like to welcome everyone here to CSIS for an issue that is obviously of great interest for a lot of people. Um, this is the largest crowd that the America's program has had uh, since a year and a half ago when President Mauricio Macri was here. Um, we had a few more, but not too many, uh, with many thousands also very likely today watching online. This is being streamed um, um, over the internet. Uh, my name is Michael Matera. I'm the director of the America's program here at CSIS. One of the most important issues that our program has focused on these last two years is the dramatic crisis in Venezuela. It is no exaggeration to say that the Venezuelan crisis is, and for several years, has been the most critical issue facing the Western Hemisphere. Where else in the world outside of Syria have we seen almost four million desperate refugees flee a country ravaged by hunger and by disease? For that reason, we've spent an enormous amount of time and effort focusing attention on what has been a very complex political, economic, social, and humanitarian crisis. Our work has been led by Moises Rendon, our associate director, who is traveling this week on a Venezuela initiative and is in Berlin, unable to, to reach us, but I think he's probably watching us. Hello, Moises. Over the last two months, the focus of attention in Venezuela has been the date of January 10th, 2019, when Nicolas Maduro unconstitutionally began his second term as president despite widespread international condemnation and clear evidence of fraud in the elections that took place last May 20th. On January 10th, 2019, according to the Venezuelan constitution, Juan Guaido, as the newly elected Speaker of the Venezuelan National Assembly, the only legitimate institution left in Venezuela, officially became the interim president of Venezuela. This situation was backed up by a strong resolution uh, by the Organization of American States and a statement of the Lima Group declaring Maduro's second term illegitimate. This position was strongly supported by the United States and by a bipartisan majority of the U.S. Congress. Following Guaido's assumption of the interim presidency, he has already been recognized by uh, more than 20 nations, including the United States, Canada, Australia, and most of Latin America, and the European Union uh, will soon join the consensus. Uh, they've given Maduro eight days to hold an election. Maduro has already said that he will not do that. In a manner that has not always been the case in the past, the region, represented by the OAS and its Secretary General, Luis Almagro, working closely with the Lima Group, uh, which brings together countries of the region, um, have taken the lead responsibility for trying to press for a solution to this crisis. The U.S. government has also been working closely with the OAS and the Lima Group and is now taking an even more proactive role on the sanctions and other efforts to assure a lasting, peaceful, and democratic solution. And everyone is aware of the announcements that have been made in just the last, in the last few days, uh, including the energy sanctions that were announced last night. In what is shaping up to be a very unstable and potentially explosive situation in Venezuela, the leading author authoritarian nations of the world have stood by Maduro. Russia, Iran, Turkey, China, and Cuba, among a few others, have stated their continued recognition of Maduro. Um, the future of Venezuela is turning more clearly than ever into a proxy struggle between the authoritarian regimes and the democratic nations. Venezuela could easily become the active front on which this struggle is defined. With the increasingly strong support of the Venezuelan people who are going out onto the streets in record numbers, the situation on the ground is changing with each passing hour, moving at a very fast pace, and this pace could well speed up in the coming days. This could be the beginning of the end of the Maduro regime, according to a number of people uh, who are going to be with us today. However, there is clearly a very high level of uncertainty and the momentum could move in any direction. There are more questions than answers so far. The latest massive marches and protests on January 23rd and those that are expected to continue in the coming days are a clear sign of support for a previously little known opposition figure, Juan Guaido, who has seemingly been able to appeal to the Venezuelan people in a way that other opposition leaders have been unable to do in recent years. Will Maduro move aggressively against Guaido and arrest him, or worse? What finally, um, what would be the popular reaction to this? Is this the tipping point? 
Is this the point at which Venezuela and Maduro will finally be shown to be little more than a brutal dictator, a criminal who has manipulated the state structure and built his own power on the base of massive corruption linked to international organized crime and drug trafficking with well-trained and experienced senior Cuban and Russian intelligence operatives closely supporting the corrupted top levels of the military and security forces of the country? Venezuela seems to be developing into a proxy war between Washington and Moscow, something that is not in anyone's interest. We're not there yet, but the details seem to be beginning to emerge. One of President Guaido's, or interim President Guaido's, first acts following his assumption of Venezuela's presidency was to appoint a few key advisors in Caracas and a few other selected authorities, including a special representative, an ambassador to the Organization of American States, and a charge d'affaires to the Venezuelan embassy in Washington. Dr. Gustavo Tarre, uh, who is with us today, is Venezuela's new special representative to the OAS. Ambassador Tare is a distinguished Venezuelan constitutional law expert, attorney, and professor, and was a member of the Venezuelan Congress from 1979 to 1999. He's lived in the United States uh, since 1915 and has done work with the Inter-American Dialogue, George Washington University, and he has been a senior associate here at CSIS for the last almost three years. Uh, he is the author of numerous books and scholarly articles on topics of law and political science. Dr. Tade has agreed to join us today uh, for his first public appearance and for a public statement uh, from his new position at the OAS. After Dr. Tade's remarks, uh, we're very pleased to have Ambassador Bill Brownfield joining us to provide some commentary on the current situation in, in Venezuela. Uh, Bill was the U.S. Ambassador to Venezuela from 2004 to 2007. There are few people in Washington who know Venezuela as well as Bill does. Bill's remarks will be followed uh, by an opportunity for questions and answers and an informal discussion among the three of us, and then we will open up to the floor. Without further ado, uh, Ambassador Tade, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mike. I am at home here because for three years, as Mike Natera remembered, I have been working here in the CSIS with Michael, with Moises Rendon, who is not here right now, but is the soul of the Venezuelan project, and with Mark Schneider, and a lot of people here who helped us a lot uh, in the fight for democracy in Venezuela. It's not very easy to speak here before Ambassador Brownfield. Not only because his knowledge of Venezuela. It's not easy because you are here representing a coup. You are totally illegitimate. Nobody elected Juan Guaido, and nobody legitimate appointed you. I always think about the good faith of everyone. And the only answer to, I have to this lady is to invite her to go to Venezuela. And all the things she is thinking now, I am sure that in a few hours will be changed. I was speaking about Ambassador Brownfield, about his, his knowledge of Venezuela, but what is making him a very difficult uh, companion of a panel like this is his sense of humor. I am sure that you are not only appreciate his intelligence, but you are going to laugh, to laugh about several jokes I am sure he's going to tell us right now. Well, I'm st I am going to start with uh, some Shakespearean question. Maduro or Guaido? 
Every, everybody knows Maduro. Now everybody knows Guaidó, but three weeks ago, I am sure that the majority of the people here have never heard about Juan Guaidó. A very important Venezuelan analyst and thinker who lives here in Washington. Oh, another one. But it's the way that totalitarian people act. This lady should have stayed here and uh, raise her hand and explain her position. But she prefers to this kind of, of action. Fortunately for us, she is alone. In Venezuela, they came by tens of people with guns, with sticks, and uh, the situation should have been very, very different had we been in Venezuela. I, I was saying that uh, a Venezuelan analyst and thinker, a very important one here in Washington, called me and he asked me, who is going to be the speaker of the National Assembly? And I told him, Juan Guaidó. And this guy who is very, very smart, told me, Juan what? Because he, has, he had never heard of him. We, of course, he's living here from a lot of time, but uh, Juan Guaidó was not uh, the most important opposition leader in Venezuela. Uh, in the National Assembly, once the election, uh, once the, the, the two, two, 2015 election, was done, there was a pact between the different political parties. And uh, the idea was to share the speakership of the National Assembly between the different and most important parties. And uh, Voluntad Popular, which is a party of Juan Guaidó, uh, had, uh, I don't know if, if it is a, a good or a bad moment, uh, uh, they, they, they took the slot of the fourth speaker of the National Assembly. The first was Henry Ramos, then came Julio Borges, after that Omar Barbosa, and then came a very young, young political leader, Juan Guaidó. And we have now the contrast of Nicolás Maduro, who has a certain appeal to ladies like the two one we saw here, and Juan Guaidó. Uh, and this, this situation where two governments coexist in the same territory and claim the exercises of power is not new in history. It happened a lot time before in a lot of countries. And uh, from a legal point of view, there is two ways to determine which of them prevails. The first way is to solve the problem of legitimacy. Nicolás Maduro pretended to be reelected to a second term, 2019-2025. And in order to do so, he called on a, for an early election in May 2018 in violation of the Constitution, because the president has no power to call for election and has no power to choose the date of the election. It may be, it may be seen as a very strange thing that for a term ending in January, the election is, was in May last year. And the reason is very simple. Maduro knew uh, the evolution of the social and economic situation, and he wanted the election as soon as possible. Uh, but even with this trick, he was not sure that he, she, she, he, he could win the election, 
And in order to be sure uh, to be uh, to, to, to be elected president or re-elected president, he took a lot of measures, but one of them was to forbid the participation of the main opposition political parties. Imagine an election in the United States where the president, if he is a Democrat, says the Republican can't go to the ballots, or, or vice versa. A Republican president who says, okay, we have elections in this day, but Democrats can't uh, run for, for office in this election. But exactly what happened in Venezuela. Uh, Maduro shoes among friends, the opposition candidates, and uh, the result of the election, as was absolutely foreseen, was that he won the election. The press coverage of, the, of this election day was very, very clear. We saw in videos and TV spots that all the poll centers were empty. Very, very few people go to vote. Even civil servants who knew that they may, that there was a menace to fire them if they don't, if they uh, abstain in the election. And uh, the poll center were empty. The official results of an election which was ruled by the Consejo Nacional Electoral, the national authority, uh, absolutely biased and uh, with four of five, of five members, uh, very, very crowdy friends of Maduro. The results, the official results, showed an, an abstention of more or less 50%. That's the official results. The unofficial results uh, spoke about an, a, a turnout of less than 20%. Uh, but me, I, I think oh. oh. I, I would like that she stay here, hear me what I, ha I have to say, and and give her opinion. We are not like chavistas. We, we, we don't like to interrupt people. We don't like we respect others' opinions. Well, with this election, Maduro uh, was reelected president of Venezuela, and this situation has two main implications. The first, there is a void of power due from the absence of a legal and legitimate president-elect. If the election is a fraud, if the election was not fair, if the election was not recognized by the Venezuelan people and by international democratic community, well, we have no president. There is a void of power. And the second problem is that if Maduro took the oath, the oath of office uh, from this time, he, uh, he is an usurper of the political power in Venezuela because uh, his, uh, his power doesn't come from the will of the Venezuelan people, but from a fraud and a violation of the Constitution. How to solve this dilemma? The constitutional basis in order to solve this, this problem is set out in an Article 333, 333 of the Venezuelan Constitution, of the Bolivarian Venezuelan Constitution, which says, this Constitution will not lose its validity if it ceases to be observed by act of force. In such eventuality, every citizen, invested or not with authority, will have the duty to collaborate in the restoration of its effective force. The National Assembly of Venezuela, the Venezuelan Parliament, elected in 2015 
in a very, very difficult election, but the opposition won and won a two-thirds majority, even against the National uh, Electoral Authority, even against all the power of government trying to bias the process. But this National Assembly invoked another article of the Constitution, Article 233, in order to fill the void of power left in the absence of a president-elect. This article states that in the absence of a president-elect at the start of a new presidential term, January the 10th, 2019, the Speaker of the National Assembly will temporarily assume the office of President of the Republic until new elections are held. Therefore, the Venezuelan Constitution vested the Speaker of the National Assembly, Juan Guaidó, the authority to act as interim president. In order for Juan Guaidó to effectively take office, the usurpation of the president by Nicolás Maduro, who currently occupies the office, the physical building of the office of the president, must cease. Thus, the need to achieve disobedience of the Maduro regime, as stated in another constitutional article, the 350, which mandates that any activity that violates the Constitution, which is precisely what Nicolás Maduro is doing, must be disavoided. On January 11, the Speaker Juan Guaidó public, publicly ratified his intention to act in accordance with the Constitution. His decision was formalized by two resolutions approved by the National Assembly on January 15 and January 22. The National Assembly, I remember you, is the voice through which the people of Venezuela speaks. And later, on January 23rd, during a mass demonstration, you saw this photograph, and you see if as the, those ladies who were weird thinks that the people of Venezuela is with Maduro, it's a shame they are not here to see this. These are people raising their hand in the moment of Speaker Guaidó took the oath for office. And, uh, and, he, and Guaidó ratified his commitment to follow the Constitution, which designated him as acting president. It's for this reason that the event of January 23rd cannot be considered a self-proclamation. The only self-proclamated president is Nicolás Maduro, because he, he is the Miraflores Palace against the, the, the will of the people and against the Constitution. Juan Guaidó, when he began to act as interim president, was strictly following what the Constitution established. It's not that he decided, I'm going to be president. No, he was following the Constitution, the articles I read to you, and following this constitutional mandate, he took the, the, the charge of acting president where he is right now. As a consequence of all that, a large group of democratic government, the Lima Group, the OAS, very soon in the same position, the Euro European Union, and individually a lot of European countries have recognized the Speaker of the National Assembly, Juan Guaidó, as acting president of Venezuela. If you ask me which kind of support you prefer, I like this one. Uh, to be supported by North Korea, by Turkey, by China, by Cuba, by Nicaragua, is not what a Democrat, uh, uh, a believer in the freedom, will be satisfied with. The second mean of solution of this kind of crisis, crisis, and I hope I am not boring you about these legal considerations, international, international law use the concept of effective state. As a joke, people say, who is taking the phone in Miraflores? Well, Maduro is taking the phone in Miraflores, but that's an image. 
when international law speaks about effective state, that means that the exercise of authority accomplish the fundamental, the fundamental functions of that justify the existence of the state. The usurping government of Maduro doesn't assure this condition. People have nothing to eat. You saw the, the, the videos and pictures of people open the, garba the gar garbage bags in the street in order to get fo food for their children. Uh, the government of Maduro doesn't provide the most basic health services. It has allowed the destruction of the economy, the destruction of the oil industry. There is no edu educational system. The government doesn't guarantee the life and property of the Venezuelans. The government is not capable of preserving the integrity of the Venezuelan territory who has been invaded by irregular bands of uh, foreign uh, guerrilleros of, of oppos opponents of the, of the Colombian government, and a part of the territory is under the control of narco trafficker. And Nicolás Maduro allowed a foreign power, or perhaps two foreign powers, Cuba and Russia, to manage the intelligence services of Venezuela. The identif identification service, if you want the identification, the identification document, is a card we call cédula de identidad. If you go to an office in order to get it, you heard the Cuban accent of the people who manage this office. They control all the registry and notary services in order to know all the economic movement that, I, that are uh, registered in, this, in these offices. It operates the ports. And a lot of other things, you, we are invited by, by a foreign power, and therefore, the preservation of the sovereignty and the preservation of the integrity of the territory is not accomplished by Nicolás Maduro. Then, therefore, it's very difficult to speak about an effective state which limits his action to expend the tax money, the, ta the taxpayer money, in a very, very corrupt way. Venezuela is among the most corrupt in the country. It's not said by the Venezuelan opposition. It's said by very respectful organizations like Interna uh, Trans International Transparency. And uh, they spend uh, this money and in the most corrupt way in the world. And the other uh, state function they have as a monopoly is repression, is to kill people in the street, is to put people in jail. In the last four days, 26 people were murdered by police forces in Venezuela. More than 1,000 were put in jail. Uh, the army is not going out of, of their barracks in order to do that. This job is doing by the, the Bolivarian police and by what is called Venezuela de Colectivos, that are paramilitary groups working uh, in, ex, in a very, very close cooperation with the police. Uh, they, they are beginning to be called in Venezuela the Maduro Gestapo. The acting president, Juan Guaidó, has established two essential priorities. First, first of them is to begin solving the food and health deficiencies. All the Venezuelan situation, as Michael Matera reminded us, uh, was the origin of something like three million and half Venezuelan fleeing the country. And they are now in Colombia, in Ecuador, in Peru, in Chile, in Panama, in Aruba, in Curaçao, and Brazil. There are Venezuelans everywhere in the world, but uh, mainly in this country. And the, the importance of the amount of people we are speaking about make that the problem is, is no more a Venezuelan problem, it's a regional cr crisis. And that's why the United Nations Security Council, for the first time last Saturday, addressed the problem of Venezuela. 
uh, there was no result of this, of this meeting, because as you know, Russia and China have veto power, but uh, the, the thing that the, the UN accepted to discuss in the, national sec in, the, in, in, in the Security Council to discuss the problem of Venezuela is because it's a, it's a, a, a threat against the world peace and the regional stability. And that's, that's very important. Then, uh, Madu, uh, Guaido is opening all the possible channels to humanitarian aid. And the second main activity, the second main priority, he assumed, is to prepare to rule, to, to have free elections rolled by an impartial electoral authority as soon as possible in order to have transparent and reliable results. It's not very easy because the Constitution uh, very, very clearly says how the Consejo Nacional Electoral has to be selected. It's not a decision of government. It's, it's not a decision only of the, of the parliament. The Constitution established that all the civil society, universities, ONGs, uh, any kind of association of people have the right to present candidates. And then the National Assembly, among those people nominated by universities or by ONGs or by any kind of popular organization, then the National Assembly choose among those uh, who were presented by this organization, the five member of the, of the National Electoral Council. It's a paradox that the first Consejo Nacional Electoral just three days after the approbation of the Constitution was chosen without any consultation with the civil society. It was chosen by the, national, by, by, by the, the constitution, Constitutional Assembly who made the Constitution, and this assembly violated the Constitution three days, which was three days before approved. And from then, this participation of the civil society in the choosing of the electoral authority has totally disappeared. We're not going to, uh, going to power in order to violate the Constitution. And what Guaido is preparing is to, do, is to have an electoral uh, authority nominated following the rule of the Constitution and have the guarantee of a very, very transparent results with naturally with observation or of all the international community. That's very important. In Venezuela, at the beginning, when Chavez had a lot of money and was very popular, there were international electoral observation. It disappears. The observers in the last election were observers from Nicaragua, were observers from Cuba. They were not exactly the people you want to be observing a free election. But that was the electoral uh, observation we had in Venezuela uh, from many, many years ago. To achieve this goal, uh, Juan Guaido has received the support of the Venezuelan people. You can see that there. These are pictures of several cities in Venezuela, in 350 cities. And there were demonstrations like that every part in the world. And, and if you see the pictures in other capitals, I, a, a, a friend of mine who is from Chile told me that the meeting of Venezuela in order to support Juan Guaido was as big as the one, as the last one that President Piñera had for the ending of his electoral campaign. There were 10,000, uh, several thousand of people in the street of Santiago. And it happens in Madrid, it happens in Bogotá, it happens in Medellín, in Lima, in Quito, in Guayaquil, in Santiago in Rio de Janeiro, in Manaus, everywhere where there are Venezuelans here in Washington, there were people in the street. Now, this support of the people of Venezuela is very, very clear. And you contrast with uh, the support of President Maduro. 
The same day that we had this very big demonstration in the Venezuelan cities, Maduro uh, asked his people to support him in a medium-sized square in Caracas, the Plaza O'Leary. General O'Leary was an Irish uh, general who fought in the Venezuelan independence. And this is a medium-sized square. And there was so, uh, so, so little assistance there that Maduro didn't go to the rally. He stays in Miraflores, and he asked people to come to, to Miraflores. Miraflores, if you know Caracas, is a very narrow street in the colonial center of Caracas, and you fill this street with 500 people, and there were many, many patches where there were nobody. Well, one day later, Maduro asked his supporters to go to the palace and to watch there with him against the American invasion, the coup d'etat, and all the things that Maduro uh, announced. And we expected that some people uh, were present there. And when you see what videos and photographs uh, shows, there was nobody, not a few people, no, nobody. The palace was absolutely alone, ex with the exception of the guard, but not only one Chavista went to Miraflores to protect Maduro. The second thing is, as we have already said, that Guaidó has received the recognition and support of the world leading democracies. And he is starting to take measures that in the very, very beginning are the use of the power of the, pre of the pre Venezuelan presidency. The third one was my nomination. Uh, I won the first uh, ambassador, the first civil servant uh, uh, nominated by Maduro and ratified by the parliament. Today, 12 new ambassadors were approved by the National Assembly. Some days ago, uh, uh, Carlos Vecchio was uh, accepted by the State Department as Chargé d'Affaires of Venezuela, and he is now acting as the representative of the, of the Venezuelan people. All that remains to ensure the support is to ensure the support of the armed forces. That's, that's not the easy thing to wait for. The military in Venezuela for 40 years were a professional body. After Chavez came to power, he, he worked very hardly. And he, he, he knew what to do because he came from the armed forces. How to destroy the, the very principles of military organization. The first one was that every, uh, every officer, after a, X years in service, is promoted automatically. If you have uh, 40 coronels and three sp spots for, for general, for brigadier general, but we, we used to nominate three general, and the rest remain as colonels. Ch what Chavez did, he promoted the 40. And uh, now, Venezuela has more general and admirals than all the NATO together. Not only more than the US. US, the United States Army and Navy and Marine Corps and the Coast Guard have 800 general and admiral. We have 3,000. That's the way of Chavez to divide the armed forces. And uh, uh, he, with that, he tried to corrupt the officer cop, and uh, uh, sadly, some of them fell in this temptation. But the majority of the officer corp have the same problem that the majority of Venezuela. They have no food or very little food. They have no hospitals. They have no, no, no prescription drugs. Their kids go to the schools, and I have friends uh, military friends who say when I have this problem, my kid is going to high school, he wants to be an engineer, 
But in the school he is going, there is no mathematic professor, there is no chemistry professor, there is no physics professor, and what does the principal do? He gets approved with the best qualification, A for everybody. But of course, when this kid goes to the university, he has nothing to do there. And the sons of the military, with the exception of the very, very corrupt uh, bosses who send their sons to study here or to study in Europe, nobody wants to, to Bolivia or Nicaragua in order to get a degree. But you find uh, these, these sons and doctors of generals studying in the best university of the world, but not the, that's not the case for the family of the great majority of the officer corp. What is, Maduro, is Waiko doing? He is speaking directly to the military family. He is the grandson of uh, a Navy captain and a colonel of the National Guard. He said in videos that he's, he he said everywhere that he knows the military family, and uh, he addressed direct to them. He approved an uh, amnesty law in order to, to establish a transitional justice for all the, the military, all the members of the armed forces who will put their, uh, their strengths to reestablish democracy. Uh, Guaido is not asking for a coup d'etat, as those three ladies who were with us today said. He's only asking that the military personnel uh, who are kidnapped, kidnapped by an ineffective, servile, and corrupt high command to comply with the oaths they made when they received this, uh, a sword as as Navy in sign or a lieutenant to respect the Constitution. And the only thing we are asking them is you have to fulfill what you saw. And that's the hope we had. But in order to press a little of that, we have the pressure of the people in the street, and we have, fortunately, the pressure of the international community. You, say, you saw yesterday the sanctions by the Treasury Department in the United States. Similar sanctions are taken by, by other countries. And we think that this pressure of the people in the street and the economic sanction and the personal sanctions to military officers is, will be a conjunction of force that will put Maduro out. Uh, Ambassador Bromfield, I'm going to stole you your words, Ambassador uh, Brownfield used to say that as in Roman history, C Cicero always finished all his speeches saying, Cartago de lenda est, you must destroy Cartago. Well, Ambassador Brownfield says, Maduro de lendum est. And uh, I think there is no more clear words than those. Thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. I'm sorry to have told you words. Ah. <laughs> no, I'll go. I'm going to go to the podium. Put it back up. <laughs> it might be wise for me to be on my feet, just in case. Ladies and gentlemen, while he's organizing, I wish to tell you a story. In October of 2006, while I was serving in Venezuela as the United States Ambassador, I was summoned to the office of the then Foreign Minister, uh, a gentleman named Nicolas Maduro. Mr. Maduro wished to express his displeasure that at the end of the United Nations General Assembly, in the year 2006. While departing the city of New York, uh, he had been pulled into <clears throat> secondary uh, at, at JFK International Airport, and he did not like that one little bit. 
I was in his office, there was me, seated on a very small couch, kind of um, my, uh, about only four inches above the ground. He had a, a deputy foreign minister on one side and a very large uh, congressional or national assembly aide. And Mr. Maduro himself back then was a large gentleman of about 250 pounds of weight. He might be a little bit more now, I'm not at all certain. And as he got more and more exercised over this issue, and I felt a little bit trapped in this couch, I said, to myself, this is not a place where I want to be right now. I mentioned this because 20 minutes or so ago, while I was wedged into that chair right there, I also found myself saying, I'm not sure if this is where I want to be right now. But ladies and gentlemen, let me be very brief so that we can turn this conversation over to you. Here is my point. Things are happening in Venezuela today that have not happened for many, many years. Mr. Juan Guaido is in many ways acting like a president or an interim president uh, of the Republic of Venezuela. He is naming diplomats uh, to represent Venezuela abroad, something that is normally reserved to a president. He is talking to the media. He is talking to other governments in a way that is normally done by presidents of a republic, he is in fact talking both publicly and privately to representatives of the armed forces, the security forces, law enforcement, and other civilian ministries in the government of Venezuela. In short, in many ways, he is in fact, as the National Assembly has decided, acting as a president. But we as the international community I urge you all, we must be careful as we engage, as we speak, as we determine how to react or respond. We are dealing with an individual whose entire team can probably be counted on the fingers of one hand who is in an extremely vulnerable position. So what should we, as the international community, do? Thank you for asking. I will offer two thoughts in terms of a strategy. And for those of you who have had the misfortune of listening to me in the past, it is exactly the same strategy that I have been articulating for more than a year. First, as Ambassador uh, uh, Tavare so, so eloquently quoted Mr. C uh, Mr. Cicero from 2,300 or so years ago, the international community must address the reality of this government, this institution that has produced so much hunger and malnutrition a public health crisis, a lack of medicine, a complete breakdown in security on the streets of every city, town, and community in Venezuela, and forced or brought about the departure of nearly four million citizens from a country of only 32 million who have chosen to live lives as refugees rather than remain behind. We must, as an international community, respect respond to that reality. And while the specifics are certainly open to debate and negotiation, the elements are there. It's to some extent sanctions, and we saw another clear uh, piece of the sanctions package yesterday uh, by White House announcement. Uh, it, it was the decision, a decision which I think showed great courage, both by a couple of dozen American diplomats down in Caracas, plus their government up here, to refuse to accept the instruction to abandon the U.S. Embassy and go home. That was sending a very clear signal. It was the decision to bring Venezuela before the UN Security Council uh, last weekend. Does this 
do we expect the Security Council to pass a resolution? No, of course not. There are two permanent members of the Security Council who clearly will not agree to any resolution that has teeth. But merely bringing it before the Security Council is shining a light on these issues. Ditto for all the excellent work by the Organization of American States. Ditto in terms of talking to, working with, and dealing with Mr. Guaido and his representatives on governmental issues. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these are part of an ongoing effort by the international community to address the issue of this government, which has in 20 years time turned Venezuela into a functional nightmare. The second part of the strategy is what is generally referred to as planning for the day after. If, in fact, we have read the book before and we know how it ends, even though we may not know exactly when or how it will end, we, the international community, have something of an obligation to plan for that moment, the day after the collapse, and begin to think about what, in terms of assistance, of infrastructure and support can be provided. There is a great deal of planning that has already gone into this. Reports that have been developed by academics within the OAS, by a number of citizens both inside Venezuela and outside. It's time to bring them out, dust them off, and begin to assign names to the individual elements of the plan. It is time, perhaps, to decide exactly what new legislation will have to be brought before and debated and passed by the National Assembly on the day after. What resolutions would be helpful to come out of the United Nations or the OAS on the day after that event? Is there a way to provide something in the way of funding of a humanitarian nature or an anti-corruption nature or a community security nature and get it into individuals or organizations such as NGOs, such as the church or the churches, such as community leadership. This is the sort of thing that the international community can and should uh, be spending its time in the days, weeks, months, or let's be pessimists, if you wish, years uh, before this collapse inevitably occurs. And finally, uh, let us not forget that in the four million person diaspora of Venezuelans who have fled their country, there is a, a, a strong core of talent, of skill, of leadership that could somehow be mobilized uh, to provide alternative voices and to some extent, uh, some sense of hope and organization uh, to refugee populations and to the diaspora spread throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a position as the international community that I am not sure we have seen over the last 20 years of the Venezuela drama. It is a time of opportunity. It is a time of great risk. We are in this position due to the incredible courage and superb judgment of one young man in Venezuela today who has in essence accepted responsibility for what only three or four weeks ago most observers would have said is mission impossible. He has, among other things, produced near consensus 
near consensus within the United States government and within the body politic and the educated uh, observers of Venezuela in the United States as to her policies, with three exceptions noted just this selfsame afternoon. But that leaves the other 319,999,997 basically in agreement. If that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. I will close to annoy uh, the distinguished Venezuelan permanent representative to the OAS by quoting Winston Churchill. On New Year's Eve, between 1940 and 1941, Mr. Churchill went before the British people, who, somewhat to their surprise, had actually survived the year 1940, when most of the world thought they were going to lose. And Mr. Churchill started his address saying, this is not the end. This is not even the beginning of the end. It is perhaps the end of the beginning. And with all due respect to Mr. Churchill, I don't know. We may have moved on the Venezuela drama from the end of the beginning to the beginning of the end. We'll see. And much of that depends upon everyone seated in this room right now. Thanks. We are even. Well, well. Bill, uh, Gustavo, thank you both very, very much for those extremely insightful comments. Um, no, I think um, we all have a much better understanding at this point of, of really what an opportunity um, Venezuela and the international community faces at this point. Um, we're going to have a, a brief conversation. We have about 20 minutes left, but uh, I have, I'm going to start with a couple of questions. Um, Gustavo, um, Ambassador Tarre, um, a divided opposition has been um, the cause of a lot of the the extent of, the, the, of Venezuela's inability to resolve this crisis over recent years. Um, is this the real thing? Uh, is the opposition together at this point? Have they really united behind, behind uh, Juan Guaido? Um, or is the Maduro government going to be able to continue to buy off elements of the opposition as he has been doing for years? Um, is this the real thing? Well, I do, I do not agree exactly with Michael about this divided opposition in the whole 20 year history in, of the fight against Chavez. The opposition has been sometimes very united and sometimes very divided. We had both experiences. But what we can say as we are not in the play in the point we are now, as Ambassador Brown Felix explained by hazard or by chance. There are a lot of people in Venezuela doing their job in the opposition leadership. We have a lot of people in jail, a lot of people in exile, a lot of young leaders were murdered, and that was the opposition uh, working in the very, very difficult jobs to oppose a dictatorship who had, in, in, in re uh, until recent times, a very charismatic leader, and a lot, a lot of money. It was not easy. But uh, in this present, I will say that, Mike. Uh, in this present moment, the Venezuelan people is full backing Juan Guaido. And all the political parties are backing Juan Guaido. They have to, it's a democracy. And in a democracy, there are several way, ways of doing things and several, several ways of thinking. And uh, we have to discuss. And when people say says to me, why why those doesn't do that or that? Well, it's very simple. He is the chairman, the speaker of the National Assembly. He has more than 100 of member of parliament he has to, to discuss with, and to make decisions he has to convince them, and to make coalitions, 
and to uh, make alliances, and he is doing that. It's, it's more easy for a dictator to say, I want that, I decide that. Guaido is a democratic president, he has, and he has to discuss. And uh, he is a very young man, he's 35, and uh, he has a very interesting experience because he didn't knew democracy. When, when Chavez came, when Guaido was 15, all his life and all his political life is, uh, have been in, in dictatorship. And he has to change a, cult, a cultural phenomenon of people thinking that you have only to do that and things are done. He has not, uh, he, he, he doesn't choose the way to impose the solution, he has to discuss them. And in this discussion is the way that the opposition may remain united. Mm -hmm. And I am very hopeful that this opposition unity will remain. And after, and the day after, when the election will be programmed, each political leader will choose his way. And uh, the Venezuelan people is going to choose who is going to rule the country, not as an active president, but uh, as president of the republic. Bill, I don't need to tell you, please chime in whenever you'd like uh, with questions, answers, or, any, or Latin quotes, okay. or whatever comes to your mind. <laughs> I would never dare to, to suggest anything further from the distinguished gentleman to my left, res ipsa loquitur. <laughs> we were hoping to have a Spanish interpreter here today, but we didn't, we decided against it, but in the future we will always both with Gustavo and with Bill Brownfield, we will have a Latin interpreter uh, for those of you who don't speak Latin. Um, another question, we've talked pretty frankly about the perverse role of Cuba and Russia in Venezuela. And I think there's little, it's, it's, it's not um, overstating things to say that they have played a very perverse role um, on the intelligence side, on the military side. Um, in buying up assets, in buying up energy assets. Um, uh, we have mentioned China. Um, Dr. Tarre, Ambassador Tarre, could you talk a bit about the role that China has played? Um, it is a less perverse role, but we know that China has financed um, over $60 billion of support for the Maduro regime in recent years. Um, could you talk a little bit more about this and what, what price is China going to pay? What price is Cuba going to pay? What price is Russia going to pay for the role that they have been playing in Venezuela in recent years? There are very different circumstances about each of these countries. The Chinese are doing business in Venezuela mainly. When they lend money to Venezuela, it's with the condition that Venezuela buys China products. And uh, they have uh, certainly invested a lot of money in Venezuela, but this money goes back to China when uh, the government is forced to buy Chinese products. I was in the UN last Saturday and I heard the Chinese ambassador. He spoke something like three minutes and he said that he was he doesn't agree with the U.S. policy against Venezuela, that he thinks that this problem has to be solved among Venezuelans, and that's all. You see the difference with the Russian ambassador as with the Cuban Chariot affair that were really engaged in a political fight. Then uh, with China, I don't think we're going to have problems because they need oil and we need to sell oil. Remember that we used to sell the majority of our production to the United States. And right now, the, the oil production of the United States is large enough in order to not need Venezuelan oil. We need new markets. And without thinking that he was doing the right thing, Chavez opened those markets for us. And then the continuity with business with China, I'm sure, with China and India. I'm sure that the future of Venezuelan energy industry is linked 
to these markets. Russia has geopolitical ambitions. That's a difference. I don't say that China doesn't have, but it's not a priority. The, the South China Sea and the, all the problem they have there, the construction of a very powerful navy, all the things we all know uh, will perhaps in the future uh, will be very important for China and uh, in, in, in Latin America. But right now, I don't think so. Russia has this ambition, but had not the money for, to, to enforce and to fulfill this ambition. And they are in Venezuela, but what we owe them are mostly uh, the, the price of weapons. Very, very bad quality weapons. Uh, the Venezuelan Air Force has uh, Sukhoi fighter bombers. I spoke with retired Venezuelan pilot who said me that this kind of plane was the worst thing the Russian had, and they sell us to they sell them to Venezuela in the middle of a big corruption business. The planes were not updated; they're not the best technology. And uh, pilot, Venezuelan pilot, we were used to fly F-16. They are not happy with the Sukhoi. The Russian helicopters, and we bought something like 30 helicopters, doesn't fly in Venezuela because 20 of them went down. And the pilots doesn't accept to fly these kind of helicopters. But we owe this money. And we are going to be very tough in renegotiating how we pay that because they didn't sell us what the contract said. And there will be a discussion about that. We are going to be in front of something, not very, someone not very kindly and very difficult in order to make a deal. But I am very trustful that the Venezuelan ambassador to Moscow will have a very, very good job to do. And the Cuban is very simple. Uh, when the Soviet Union felt there was an economic disaster in Cuba, they called that the Perido Especial, they had no the Russian money, and the economic situation was a disaster. And as a miracle, Chavez came and started to give money to, the, to Cuba. A lot of money, a huge amount of money. For instance, we had 10,000 of medical doctors in Venezuela, Cuban medical doctors in Venezuela. There were not very good doctors, but it's better a not so good doctor at the lack of doctors. But the problem was that the Venezuelan health ministry pay each uh, Cuban doctor $4,000. 3,700 dollars went to the Cuba's government, and 300 to the doctor. The 300 was more than the, doc the Venezuelan doctor, who were a lot better than the Cubans, were paid. But these people, uh, the majority of them fled Venezuela. A lot of them are here, because they went from Venezuela to Colombia, and from Colombia uh, to the US. And they came here with the Cuban, and the, Cu the Cuban community, especially in South Florida, welcomed them. And, uh, and they went to Brazil. President Bolsonaro said that he was very willing to let the Cuban doctor in Brazil, but he was going to pay them directly. The $4,000 will be for the doctors, not for the Cuban government. And uh, Cuba needs desperately Venezuelan money, and it, it is not going to have it. We are now giving for free 50 thousand uh, uh, daily Thousands. barrels of oil, and that will stop the same day that uh, we have the totality of the state power in Venezuela. And they are going to have to look for money anywhere else. Great. Michael, may I, may I just add a, add a point here? And, and by the way, I think Gustavo has it exactly right. 
Uh, what is the Cuban interest? It's 50,000 barrels of oil a day to an energy-starved nation. What is the Chinese approach? It is very much a, 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 an economic approach, which is to say there are raw materials of great importance to the Chinese economy that are located in Venezuela, and they have a long-term economic interest in having access to them, driven by economics. Russia is more complicated. They do not need oil. They are, in fact, one of the three largest pr oil producers in the world right now who produce more than their national need. Uh, they it is geostrategic politics. I would offer everyone two thoughts, because I have taken this question from excellent representatives of the media over the last week with some frequency. First, it, don't listen that closely to the words that you hear from the governments uh, of China or Russia. See if they put another billion or two or three billion investment into Venezuela. Money talks, and I have not seen evidence of that, which suggests that they, too, are pausing and taking a look at what happens. And second, if I could be Russia-specific briefly, I would note, and we all realize this, that over the last 10 years or so, uh, Russia uh, annexed the Crimea and the Western democracies criticized and protested. Uh, Russia created two new republics, one in South Ossetia, the other in North Georgia, I believe, and the Western world protested. Russia at least supported, and I would argue actually infiltrated large numbers of security personnel into the two easternmost uh, provinces of Ukraine, and the Western world criticized. But at the end of the day, geography and history determined. The Crimea is still under Russian control. South Ossetia and North Georgia still exist as independent states, and Russian influence is still uh, quite visible in Donetsk and whatever the other uh, province is called. All right, that is geographic reality. We are now in the Western Hemisphere. If Brazil and Colombia and Argentina and Canada and the United States take a position, those same geographic realities will, in fact, move in the other direction. Of course, we must listen uh, to the Russian and Chinese governments. Uh, they are two of perhaps the three most important governments in the world, but we're entitled to use our brains as we calculate what they are saying and how we respond to it. Very well stated, Bill, as always. Um, we have 10 more minutes. Um, I'd like to take a few questions. Um, to make this a little bit interactive. Um, Mark Schneider, who has been a major part of our Venezuela effort at CSIS, I'm gonna give you the first question. You've got it. Um, as always, uh, Ambassador Tare and also Ambassador Brownfield, uh, your comments have been exceptionally clear. Uh, let me ask two questions. One related to the comment about the need to plan for the day after and at the same time, the need to ensure that we're not doing something, the international community is not doing something that may harm the process being managed by uh, President, the interim president, uh, Guaido. And in that regard, uh, is it possible um, that the interim president might request from the international community, particularly the international financial institutions, the beginning of a plan for the day after in terms of both macroeconomic support, given that at the moment my memory is that uh, Venezuela has lost 50% of its GDP and IMF suggests it may hit 10 million percent inflation next year. Uh, and so not only with respect to the macroeconomic policy, but also helping a new democratic government deal with the financing of restructuring all of state institutions to provide services to the people. We'll take a few questions and then uh, get our answers. This gentleman here. Yeah, thank you. I was not planning to ask a question, uh, just enjoy the conversation. My name is Georgi Skoli, I'm a DCM at the Embassy of Georgia. I just wanted to echo on a uh, uh, few uh, words that the Ambassador Brownback has mentioned. 
uh, when it comes to Georgia and, uh, and the regions of Georgia, they are not independent states, they are occupied uh, regions and occupied by Russia. Recognize so well. Recognized as occupied regions by international community, including the Congress of the United States. Unfortunately, regimes such as Maduro regime and uh, the government of the Maduro has recognized them uh, as independent states, and that was uh, due to their close relationship to Russia. Uh, and our hope is that there was a change, and there was a change of the government. Of course, the due course in that will reverse as well. So the geopolitical strategy of Russia is not only uh, in energy and military, but it's uh, in overall expansion of its uh, of its overall global uh, global influence. So thank you for that. Great, thank you for that comment. Uh, we have a question back here. The the young woman. Thank you. Um, my name is Sonia Schott uh, with Schott International Consulting. According to the remarks of Ambassador uh, Tarre and Ambassador Brownfield, the role of the international community has been key, key in this situation. We see every day more countries adding the support to the new elected or actually the interim president Juan Guaidó. Uh, we have seen also the majority of Venezuelans supporting the interim president. So, but the question is how to deal with President Maduro who seems to stick on power and he has the monopoly of the force in Venezuela. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And this, our diplomat colleague here. Um, thank you, my, my name is Dr. Rakab Malik. I'm a Fulbright scholar uh, currently at the Elliott School. Um, I think it's very important to recognize over the past few years how the gravity of this situation, uh, is it not imperative that you have to manage very carefully that this, this potential conflict doesn't kick in to a violent conflict um, by not pushing it too far and being very intelligent in the way you ut utilize your strategies and to produce an, a favorable outcome for the people of Venezuela. Okay, if we can take those questions, I think that's probably going to be uh, all we're going to have time for today. Um, Bill Gustavo, the floor is yours. Start first. All right, I hate to, I hate to make you defer to me, but, but uh, I'll offer thoughts on all of them, and then you will correct me, Gustavo. Um, it, it, if it, if the interim president, Juan Guaido, uh, asked the international community uh, by whatever mechanism, which is to say through the OAS or other international organization, directly to governments, uh, through the media, uh, for assistance and planning for, for the, the, the day after, as, as we call it, yes, of course, the answer should be yes. Uh, but, but let me remind everyone of that old refrain, let's not reinvent the wheel a lot of work has already been done. That should logically be the starting point. To the distinguished gentleman uh, representing the government of the Republic of Georgia, for, whom I, for which I have the utmost respect, uh, I say right on, brother, I think you should have every right in the world, not only to suggest, but perhaps even to insist uh, of a reversal of the recognition decision uh, by the, the, the government of Venezuela uh, of the two independent republics that have historically, traditionally, and for, uh, for, for centuries been part of Georgia. What if Maduro hangs on yet once again? Which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is not inconceivable. It's happened before. We had not quite this much of a conversation, but in 2017, some sense that things might be happening and they did not happen. Is it possible again? Of course it is. That is why we talk about a strategy, an international community strategy with two elements. One element being focused on the Maduro de Landum Est, the removal of that government, and that strategic component is not eliminated until someone new has moved into Miraflores Palace, and the second related but, but, but separate element of planning for the day after. And 
I've now forgotten what the fourth question was, so I'm turning that over to Dr. Chabre, uh, as well as all of the other questions to correct. Thank you, Bill. Uh, the Mark's question about the day after is very, very important. But I am a lot more afraid of the day before than about the day after. There are a lot of people in Venezuela working for that day in universities, in think tanks, and not, so, not only in Venezuela, but abroad. We have in Harvard University, Dr. Ricardo, Ricardo Hausmann leading a group of economists and experts preparing a, an economic plan, and it's not the only one. And uh, some two months ago, there was a national meeting uh, of the National Front, is the front of all the people, all the democratic people in Venezuela. And uh, in this uh, event, uh, they talk about the Plan País, the country plan, who is ready, there are of course, a lot of job to do, but uh, who is, uh, which is ready to be put to the table of the minister, of the president and the ministers in the very moment that uh, Maduro is out of Miraflores. In, in foreign policy, there will be a lot of things to do. And of course, Venezuela, who, who, who is the best friend of terrorist Islamic organization, of Russia, of North Korea, this is going to change. We are going to come back to our true friends and to recognize democratic fighters everywhere in the world. Uh, the, 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 the possibility of, of violence, of of things uh, going worse, and even of civil war, I have a, an answer for that. I don't think there is anybody in Venezuela who is willing to die for Maduro. In civil wars, normally there are people who believe, have strong beliefs, and tragically that ends with a lot of violence. In Venezuela, there are corrupt people, there are people who are people who, are, uh, who have sympathies to Maduro, but people who want to fight and die for Maduro, I think there is nobody, not even Celia, his wife. <laughs> and, and I will end with uh, a new quotation. I have a, gran a granddaughter here in, in, in Venezuela, I, I, I am the grandfather, and he's a little girl, and she arrives to my house yesterday, and she said to me, eh, Granddad, eh, I think that Guaido is a true president of Venezuela. And they said to, to her, ex ore pulvororum veritas. <laughs> From the mouths of the children comes the truth. <laughs> and the truth. Right, we will have a Latin interpreter next time. Uh, <laughs> So, oh, Ambassador Tarre, Ambassador Brownfield, I'd like to thank both of you um, very sincerely for your participation here today. Uh, Ambassador Tarre, we all wish you extremely well in your thank new you. responsibilities. You have a very, very important job um, that, that you're undertaking at this point. Um, we're, as Bill said, uh, with a time of opportunity and a time of great risk. Um, we look forward to seeing how this dynamic develops, and we look forward to continuing uh, our coverage of Venezuela here at CSIS. Thank you all very much for coming. If we can thank our two guests. <laughs>